and welcome to our next episode of the Investing in the American Dream podcast, where we discuss the basics and necessary legal requirements of EB-5. Today, we have special guests, Ronnie Fieldstone and Rohit Kapuria from Saul Ewing LLP, a full-service national law firm with more than 400 attorneys and a team of top-notch business professionals, all working together to deliver practical, proactive advice and excellent client service. Ronnie and Rohit have extensive expertise in the EB-5 industry, resulting in them having a track record of handling hundreds of EB-5 projects and have helped raise billions of U.S. dollars. Their insights shed light on crucial aspects of EB-5 investments, including legal intricacies and investor considerations. Joining them is FPP's own Manuel Ortiz, who discusses the role that FPP plays in the EB-5 process as well as FPP's most recent investment opportunity, Talus. Together, Manuel, Ronnie, and Rohit discuss significant elements of the EB-5 visa program, engaging in discussions on EB-5 fundamentals, the significance of due diligence, and more. So without any further ado, let's get into it. So just to get started, um, Manny, I think... I think it would be good just for you to kind of get us into what is EB-5 and how it works. Sure. And I think you touched on it very well. I think one of the most important things in EB-5 is education and investors actually understanding what is EB-5, because the reality of it is, is that EB-5 is a lot of different things. It just depends on who you are. First and foremost, it's a program that was created by U.S. Congress in 1990 that allows for the applicant, a spouse, and unmarried children under the age of 21 to obtain permanent U.S. residency. I think that's very important. But at the same time, the U.S. government created this program to spur economic development. So there's a benefit. So EB-5 is also a job creator. It's also a financing tool for developers. At its core, yes, it is an immigration uh, program, but it does provide other benefits to both the U.S. economy and to developers. And really, EB-5, although it was founded back in 1990, it really didn't get popular until 2008, 2009, when the financial crisis started happening Mm -hmm. and everything stopped. Banks were closed. Nobody was lending. Projects were stopped, and it became a very attractive way to finance some of these projects and create jobs during a very difficult time. Ronnie, I think, you know, back in in those days when things started really ramping up in 2008, 2009, I'm sure you saw a lot of that transactional volumes continue to increase and a lot of interest primarily coming out of Asia. Correct. Uh, the Between uh, 08 and 09 really kicked in. I think 09, there was like 35 regional centers in the country. Now there's, it reached at one time, reached over a thousand. Now there may be 600. And it was just minuscule. And the whole program was, and it was amazing because the adjudication time was so fast. It was a totally different animal. You would file, you get adjudicated in four months. Investors were getting adjudicated in four months because there was no backlog. And the program was so underutilized until mainland China became a major player, probably Rohit in 2011, 2012, China kicked in and became the dominant market. But it, 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 you're right, the number of transactions started mushrooming dramatically. And then finally, because of China in August of 2014, they finally retrogressed where they met their visa limit for the first time. So until then, it was open season for China to migrate as many and nationals as possible to the United States, which was very well received. Ronnie, can you touch on some of the requirements for the investors and maybe what the benefits are for them as well? I mean, the, the, well, the, it's an interesting program for this reason. The, the investors are getting two benefits and they're equally important. I want to say this, people don't think this way, obviously. A lot of people used to think the investors just want their green card. They didn't care about their getting their money back. That is totally not true at all. Never was true and it's surely not true today. So when you do it, what's very interesting about uh, the EB-5 program is the number one goal is safety. The investors are really not looking. The return is not that relevant to them. It's not as critical as the safety of the investment. They much rather have a safer investment, be guaranteed, you know, be very assured they're going to get their money back with a small return. 
and get their conditional residency, which leads to permanent residency for their family. And let's understand when you look at what they're getting, it's pretty valuable because they're getting their whole family migrates to this country. There is no fee. Yeah. They get their fee back. They play an administrative fee, which varies. That's a fee to, you know, sponsor the program for the sponsors and the regional centers and people that make money providing the service. And unlike a typical offering up a security, which is unique about EB-5 is that the sponsors are married to the investors for the life of the program. Mm -hmm. Not like a broker that sells you a security and then they're done. Yeah. This is the opposite. The sponsor, the regional center, they are committed and obligated, especially under the new law, to be there for the investor all the way through the immigration process until they get their 829 adjudication, at which time they're on their own because they got their condition, they got their conditional residency, then they get their permanent residency after the and Rohead will explain the concept of that. And so and uh, and I'll give one more comment on this issue. Uh, the more stress, political stress in countries, the more desirable the EB-5 program comes for those countries. So in the, some of the countries which are obvious having a lot of stress today, in particular China, a lot of Latin American countries, Russia, Ukraine, mm -hmm. I can go, it's quite obvious, you know, a lot of Europe, so people want to come here, one, to educate children as a priority, and two, they want to, they want to come here for a new life of uh, maybe you could call it democracy or, or freedom, but it, that's become a really relevant factor today, much more than ever, because people are nervous about their societies where they live. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a huge driver we've seen from uh, those markets as well. Rohit, can you touch on what it would take for someone to qualify with this program? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, one of the biggest factors on this issue is at the end of the day, it's an investment program, right? So unlike some uh, majority of the other programs that we have from an immigration perspective, you either have a family-based immigration structure where a family member is petitioning on behalf of a foreign national. And then there's a degree of relevance depending on what that familial tie is. The more immediate the family tie, the uh, stronger the application or the shorter the processing time, but then there's still an element of place of birth. Certain individuals born in certain countries because of an excess demand and a limited supply have to wait much longer. The other component is an employment-based program. And EB-5 falls under the employment-based program umbrella but within that, out of the five programs that are on the employment-based program, which is EB-1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, EB-5 is the only investment-based element. The balance of them are focused on having either a qualification level by virtue of education or by virtue of uh, you know, your, your underlying work experience, mm -hmm. or there is the EB-4 program, which is strictly for religious workers. Uh, but beyond that, the timeline and the process really boils down to your investment dollars. And what Congress had intended when they created the program back in 1990 was if an individual is going to contribute a large capital investment amount, and that particular amount of capital is going to be used for the benefit of economic impact and economic growth and creation of jobs, and that person has you know, a clean background, doesn't have any ties to any criminal activity, then Assuming you meet all of the components, the person would qualify for uh, for conditional residency and, and subsequently permanent residency in the United States alongside their spouse and any children under the age of 21. Over time, the program has gradually gotten a little bit more complicated as it became more popular because the government began to spend more and more attention and look at what is the program about, what is it actually generating in terms of revenue, and then how is it driving economic growth? Under the new era of the EB-5 program, the focus really is on integrity. So integrity is a key focus. Mm -hmm. And as we're looking at the petitioners, we're really scrubbing to ensure, one, the person has no criminal background or any sort of judgments, legal judgments or otherwise in the past 10 years. Two, they've been a strong taxpayer. And you know we have to demonstrate seven years of tax returns between the investor and the gift or that's involved in the process. Three, 
ensure that uh, by virtue of their background, outside of just any bankruptcies, no criminal activity. And four, the capital that's being sourced, we can demonstrate where it comes from. And this is the most difficult part of the process. Sourcing to a very detailed forensic degree where the $800,000 plus the administrative fee actually comes from. If you can pass that and you can pass the sniff test, then you kind of move to the next uh, part of EB-5. Yeah. Great points. Can you maybe describe, and I, I suppose this is a question for both of you, but how an interaction would look like with an investor, you know, what, um, what your role is really when, when you're dealing with them? Sure. I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that first. I deal with investors on a daily basis, multiple calls, uh, you know, the unfortunate element of waking up very early in the morning for calls that are, you know, time zone driven. Uh -huh. um, a lot of times as we're talking, as I'm talking with investors, the key is, well, let's talk about your source of funds, right? That's the, the most critical part, because when you file an EB-5 application, there's two components. What's the project you're going into? How does it qualify? And we're going to you know, talk about the analysis and the diligence components on this call and this webinar as well. But specifically for the investor, a large part of our call is really focused on their money. And so let's use a very simple example. Um, investor says, I've got capital currently sitting in a, an investment account. And you know, it's, it's more than sufficient in order to cover the corpus that we need for EB-5. Great. How did your money get into the corpus accounts? I mean, into the investment account. Well, I've been a salaried individual working for XYZ company for the last 10 years. Great. How does your salary actually come in? Well, it goes into XYZ bank account every month. And then from XYZ bank account, I unilaterally and discretionally make an, a, 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 you know, a transfer down to my investment account. And then my investment advisor actually uh, invests the capital for me. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Can we go into your, invest into your actual bank accounts? Yes. What other things impact your bank account outside of salary? Oh, I've got rental income that comes from uh, three properties I own. Fantastic. Let's talk about the rental properties. How did you acquire the rental properties? And so it really becomes this triangulation as we're trying to focus on the money sitting in the investment account, but going back in time to really source it. Because one thing that we have to be clear on, the government uh, USCIS in particular, does not believe money is fungible. So if you have $2 million sitting in an investment account, we only need 800000 We can source 800000 Well, you still have the balance $1.2 that they're going to want to know where that comes from. Yeah. So a lot of the interaction with the clients really is working over probably four or five weeks as we're doing that back and forth diligence because before we file an application, we want to know that we can source it properly. And then we can make the application to the government saying, look, we've vetted it. Now, you, you the government, are obviously are going to do your own vetting. But this is our analysis. This is our report. This is how we came up with the process. And this is how the money moved. Yeah, Roy, why don't you talk about mortgaging properties, too, where you have a property and you mortgage it? And because, you, you, because that's a way of getting money, but that's not good enough. Why don't you explain that one? Yeah. So... Mortgage property is very common. A lot of folks purchased a piece of property, uh, let's say 10, 12 years ago, they bought it, um, let's say for $100,000 and then valuation has now skyrocketed to 500,000, right? And that's gonna be part of the corpus. If the property was bought on a mortgage where they put a 20% down payment and then they actually service the mortgage over a period, the government wants to know where the money came for the down payment and where the where the source of funds came for a servicing of the mortgage. Yep. Eventually, when they do mortgage that property, refinance and get capital out, they will want to see that full traction of the capital and how it moved out. Every source is a little different. Um, you know, different countries have different processes. And, and keep in mind, certain countries have remittance re restrictions on using such mortgage or property. So it's also something you have to be compliant with that uh, person's country of, of origin and ensuring they're not violating the law over there because the government's going to ask the question, how do we know you didn't violate the law in your home country when you were sending the money um, down to the U.S.? So, that, you know, several different prop, uh, structures, but, you know, five to seven different versions along the way where people come up with their source of funds and we're doing that diligence on it. 
Very good. Ronnie, could you discuss what legal documentation is required? Maybe some common challenges you see? Okay. Very good. So ROWIT is focused on the investor side. Mm -hmm. I'll focus on the project side because my, my practice is project specific. I know I, I'm obviously dealing with the knowing the immigration limitations, of course, always, because we can work together like this as a team. So basically, let's understand two things. One, that we are selling a security. Mm -hmm. It's a security. Can't deny it. It's a security. And so therefore, when you go to market to go to an investor, they're making an investment. It's not, a, it's not just because they're getting the potential, potentially getting a green card, but they're also investing money with, quote, the expectation of profit. That profit doesn't have to be a large profit, but there is an expectation of profit. So there, we believe the investors have to get something, whether it's a small percentage, they still have to get a profit motive. So what's involved? Very traditional SEC private placement offering documents. So that means a full disclosure document, whether that be a full PPM or a subscription package with a lot of exhibits for smaller transactions, copy of the subscription agreement, copy of the applicable partnership agreement or um, operating agreement, you know, where you invest, it's called the NCE, New Commercial Enterprise. So the investors put their money under the regional center program. They don't invest directly. They invest through their sponsored program through a licensed regional center. So what does that mean? Remember, you have to prepare your documents. The documents have are quite lengthy. Usually our documents are well over 100 pages, just a PPM. So the whole package is probably more like 200 pages or more. And what does that involve? Half of it involves the, pro the, the project and discussing the project and the risk factors related to the project. 90 to 95% of EB-5 capital is raised for real estate. It's real estate based. So you're really doing, whether it's a hotel, multifamily, office, industrial, mixed use, you're describing the project, the industry, the background of the developer, because at the end of the day, you're depending upon the developer. The And then you get into the due diligence of the regional center sponsor. The regional center and sponsor, many times they are the regional center and the sponsor, and sometimes they're not the regional center, but they're the sponsor. So in that mm -hmm. case, if you look at that fees role, they're responsible as a sponsor to make sure first that the documents are done correctly and overseeing the documents. So what does that mean? That means hiring attorneys that are know what they're doing and they're doing a good job and hiring the ec economic, they call the economist, the economic person develops the economic report and the person that develops or the firm that develops a business plan. They can be the same company or they could be two different companies. We do it, we, we sometimes we have two different professionals providing two different services. And sometimes there's certain companies that do both at the same time. And so that's very important. So mm -hmm. Rowan will tell you from a immigration point of view, all of the information in their plans are checked by USCIS and they need to be consistent with all the offering documents. There can't be any, the dollars have to be perfect. And in addition, we have to make sure that when we do, then, then what do we have to do? Then we have to, it's typically a loan program. It doesn't have to be. The NCE could make a preferred equity investment or a common equity investment, but substantially most transactions are loan transactions. So what's the next issue? You're making a loan. And the, the key from an investor standpoint is making sure that this loan is underwritten as if it was a private equity loan, not just an EB-5 loan. In other words, this is not funny money. This is serious dollars. And we expect to get our loan paid back. Mm -hmm. you know, every, we're designing a program where we don't... Now, you can have a 9-11. You can have a COVID. We all know what happened during COVID with hospitality. Stuff happens. You don't control that. So there's no guarantee. Like how many companies went bankrupt how many people had trouble during the financial crisis we don't that that is excusable you can't determine market conditions and uh, geopolitical disasters but you can control who's your developer what's their track record have they defaulted have they paid their loans how how have they been and you look and then you look at the project what type of project is it you usually get an appraisal a feasibility study a marketing study so you're getting the general 
description that the fact that they're investors doesn't matter. We got to do this correctly as if it was our money collectively. I'm saying collectively, everybody involved looks at this like this is our money. We got to protect it. And the fact that the investor is the one putting the money in doesn't change the fact that we have to take the same diligence as if this was a bank making a loan with their own money. And that's it. So that's, I think, a very important man. will talk about that a little. But so the that end of it is critical. And, and by the way, all that information, all of it goes into now what's called the nine, a Form 956F filing, which Rohit will talk about. So that goes to the government. And the beauty of it is once the project is approved, the government no longer has to review the project. So the new law, the Integrity Act, has made it a lot easier from that point of view because we have to physically file, believe it or not, physically file a 956F package, physically. It can't be done electronically. But from there on, it's in the system, and the investor package does not have to include the project information anymore. Much more efficient. So, uh, Ro, maybe you want to comment on that process, because then Manny will talk about some of the things that you guys do on the process of what I just talked about, how everything is converged together and has to be totally consistent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so th there used to be a process back pre prior to 2022 when we would make the filing. At that point in time, it was called the uh, exemplar application, which was not necessary. It was not a requirement, but the project would be able to file all of their project documents, the private place memorandum, uh, operating agreement, subscription agreement, business plan, economic impact report, and all the underlying support documents to show why the project actually qualified under EB-5 law. post uh, March 15, 2022, it is now a requirement for every project to do that, or rather every regional on behalf of every, uh, every regional center on behalf of every project to actually do that. And the reason why is they want one consistent bucket of what the underlying project documents look like. Mm -hmm. Therefore, when the government uh, is actually reviewing the investor petitions, they can go back mm -hmm. to the to the 956F, as it's called, look at what's in there. And once they approve it, they say, you know what, we're just going to focus on the source of funds for everybody. But the consistency element that Ronnie was just talking about is critical because if you have a private place memorandum that says the development is um, involves the uh, a hotel hospitality project at the corner of X and Y, and there'll be 220 rooms and the projected development cost is 101 million, but then the business plan and economic impact report says same location, but it's 200 rooms, not 220. And the development is actually 95 million, not 101. Well, there's a discrepancy. That by itself then creates a question of integrity for USCIS to say, well, if the documents themselves are not consistent, how do we know and how can we believe this project is actually going to be um, as stipulated? So they want to see, they being the government wants to see that it's been properly vetted. There's a lot of due diligence. They want actual support for the projections. If the developer is making a projection that occupancy rate is going to be 85%, well, what's the basis? How are you actually making that assumption without a backup of a market study or some third party element? If you're saying that the capital stack, which is the development element has you know, bank financing and you know, equity of this and, and you know, EB-5 of this projected amount, what is the basis for that? So they really, they're vetting it from a perspective of something a senior lender would actually do in many cases. So that, uh, you know, on behalf of the investor, at least the government said, well, this looks good. You know, we're not going to rep and warrant as the government that it's going to happen, but everything you've provided seems to make sense. Therefore, we're going to, you know, check the box of, you know, green light for you. Yeah, let me make a comment too. Think about it. If you're making a, not a first mortgage loan, but a second mortgage loan or a second MES loan. And, and that's common. There's a senior indebtedness in EB-5 projects. The, 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 most, there, the thing that cannot be done is you can't, and we tell clients this, you cannot spend any EB-5 money on a, especially a vertical project that where you know the project is not going to be completed. You can't have a half-built building. That is unacceptable. So USCIS will issue a what's called an RFE request for evidence if you don't at least have a signed term sheet or something of viability if there's a senior loan confirming that the senior loan 
will be funded. Now, in some cases, the EB-5 loan may be a senior loan. If that's the case, that solves that problem because you can assume that the senior loan, the EB-5 loan, will cover the that share of the project. And usually we provide in loan documents, if you don't, if you want to raise hypothetically $70 million and you only raise 50, then you allow your developer to bridge fund the extra 20 and get a senior loan. And then the developer puts their own equity in. So developer equity, as Rohit said, there are three categories. There's developer equity, there's EB-5 financing or equity, and there's senior mortgage equity, not all the time. And a lot of times there's a, a government credits. Many projects get grants for tax credits for various reasons, and um, that counts towards equity as well. So there's a lot of moving parts. It's a very sophisticated financial model, and good sponsors understand that and navigate that even before they go to way before they go to market. Man, you may want to talk about that one. Yeah, I was going to mention one one quick thing as well because I really love this discussion because it includes the investor perspective of it and also the the investment side, the security side that you're talking about um, as well, Ronnie. I think that as an investor is looking at EB-5, there are so many moving parts, right? There's the regional center, there's the developer, there's the immigration attorney. And if you're looking at it for the first time, you're basically thinking, well, what's what and who is who? And I think that you know the most digestible way to think through this if you're a first time investor is to realize that there's an immigration process and there's an investment process. They're moving in, in a line together straight, but they're moving also independent of each other. And I think what, what Rohit was, was talking about right now as far as the documentation process for an investor when you're coming into EB-5, this is probably gonna be an oversimplification. So please definitely expand on this, but I, I feel that as an investor coming in through the immigration line, right, not the investment line, just looking at it just from the immigration lens, um, there are a couple of steps. You have the 526 step and you have the 829 step. On the 526 side, the government really wants to know where the money's coming from, how it got there, is it a good EB-5 project or not? What What is the, the, the project? Does it fall within the parameters of, of EB-5? The second step on the 829 stage is also the requirement where each investor needs to create 10 jobs. And depending on, on how the project is structured, but in particular for the regional center program, you know, it's not necessarily the people that are working at the hotel, checking you in, cleaning the rooms. It can include those, but it, it's more of a formula based on the money that's actually spent that creates economic impact, right? And, and so I think those are some of the things that you're looking at as, as an investor on the immigration side, as you're trying to look at the different steps, right? Um, on the investment side, just to mention something really quick, there's where you're investing your money into exactly what, what you said, Ronnie, you're investing into what would be very similar to a private equity investment. The only difference is that it has an immigration benefit, but the setup and the contract of it is going to be pretty much the same. You can invest in debt, you can invest in equity. You have to have a fundamentally sound EB-5 program on the immigration side because that's how, how you're going to get your green card. How did your money get here? Where did it come from? Did you create the jobs? But if that's fundamentally sound, you know, you're projected to get your green card. On the investment side, there has to be a structure that's conservative for the investor because the investment can't be guaranteed. Um, there also has to be a very strong business case or thesis of why you're even doing this. Does that make sense? And if you have both a solid immigration project and a solid investment, that makes a good EB-5 investment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're touching on due diligence right now, or at least starting to. And why due diligence is so important. And and maybe maybe one of you guys could could expand on on why due diligence is so important for an investor. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think the point is again, this is an investment. So if you were if you were a fiduciary for a bank or you were an agent of a bank or a lender, you would get everything they would get. So that's title reports, zoning reports, um environmental reports, you know, normal, and then you're, and then you're, you want to see, as Rohit said, you want appraisal feasibility study, prove, prove me your numbers. You want to see developer equity, where's the developer equity coming from? Rohit will comment that, you know, 
USCIS may want to investigate that too to make sure the developer equity is coming from a legitimate source. You have to make sure that you're now, now under the new law, you can't have a bad actor developer. I'll let Bro explain that. So your developer is prohibited if they are a bad actor because we don't want money going to bad actors because they're part of the food chain. Mm -hmm. So I think these are, and then what the key is, the, uh, and I, we're involved now with FF, FPP in a transaction where, I mean, just a loan agreement itself could take months to get finalized and negotiated because a lot of times these de developers correctly so are extremely sophisticated and they treat this like a, the developer treats this like a loan mm -hmm. and the correctly in the industry, FFP treats us like a loan. And when you have a loan, you negotiate the transaction. And the difference between a lender, a bank, and EB-5 is that when you have a bank, the bank has money to lend right away. In EB-5 world, the money is a promise to lend down the road because we got to collect it. So we have to get our loan agreement done. We get our package file. We get the EB-5 money in. That could take time. So the money, EB-5 money is funded over time. It's not like a lender saying, okay, you want 50 million. They pull the money down. It's ready day one. That's a negative of EB-5. But the positive is the fact that most times developers don't need the money right away because they've got their equity in the land and the initial development, and they can take money over time. And what's important, it's very interesting when Rowan and I deal with this, is a track record of the sponsor. Has the sponsor raised money? Have they, if, they, if they've taken on a deal, have they performed? Have they always raised the money? These are the things that if I'm an, even an investor and I'm a developer, I want to know that this, if I'm investing with this sponsor, I want to know that that sponsor has been successful before in doing transactions where they've been able to raise the money and they've been astute as to how they've done their diligence to safeguard a failure subject to, as I said before, geopolitical issues, which can take place. Nobody controls geopolitical issues. And that's, I think that Manny, you may want to add to that. Yes, I, I would also like to touch on really quickly because you mentioned something very important that track record really matters. Whenever you're thinking about EB-5, it's not like an investor that's coming to basically double their money in four or five years. This, this is truly a family decision. And sometimes it's for the children so they can come study in the US and when they graduate, they can basically have the freedom to apply and work wherever they want. And so, you know, for us, we were founded in 2008. We have a 100% track record in investors obtaining their, their permanent green card. Those things are, are the things that are really important as investors are actually looking at EB-5. How many times has this regional center, EB-5 capital firm, actually completed the cycle, right? That is successfully invested money, got investors to obtain their permanent green cards and returned money. The, the return money is actually very important, right? And I think that, when you do that so many times, right? We don't like to get too creative and come up with these, you know, very pioneering type of projects that are out there that you see that sound really good, but I mean, have they ever been done? You know, for us, we do like to stick to real estate because we found that it's the most conservative from a job creation standpoint. And it's just what we find that actually works. And when you're dealing with families, that's what's really important. Rohit, I don't know if you want to add anything um, to, to those points. I mean, real estate has been bread and butter for EB-5 for several years. People mm -hmm. can understand it. Now, are there other non-real estate projects out there? Sure. They've been, uh, there are a number on the market right now, and there have been a number over the history of EB-5. But what I've noticed many times is when we deviate from a particular asset class that not only is the um, the industry uh, you know, capable of fully understanding and, and diligencing, but when you get into something more quirky, the diligence concept becomes a little bit more complicated. Many times the investors may not fully understand it. And you may also have USCIS as an agency not being able to fully comprehend because they're used to brick and mortar. They're used to seeing the numbers associated with the brick and mortar um, as opposed to something that's in a slightly different category. Um, but that goes down to also what the investors are looking for. Uh, I would say majority of the investors I work with on a daily basis like real estate, they're sometimes when I'm talking to them, they don't want that particular asset class. And so it's it's a it's a level of choice. As Ronnie said, you're purchasing a security and part of your purchase of a security is you're also buying into whatever that underlying concept is. 
and the, the investor will make a decision on the basis of that comfort. Investors, I think, are aware of it. By the way, we assume, by the way, for everybody on this call, we assume investors are sophisticated. We do, we do not underestimate investors. Some people used to think investors really don't understand. They rely on this, they rely on that, and that's not true. They, they're very sophisticated. A, a, good, a good number of them speak English, although a lot of the documents are translated into native languages for the nationals. And they really do ask a lot of questions and they're very knowledgeable today, especially given the internet and everything going on and the ability to access global information except in certain countries, which I won't mention. And, um, and you know, so we, we, we have to, they're, pretty, they're, they're smart. They may not be sophisticated in the industry or the real estate, but they read things and they come up with a lot of good questions. So um, it's very important that the sponsor be willing and able to, to answer those questions. And by the way, it's perfectly legal, even at an offshore offering for the investor to come to the United States visit the property, meet the developer, and do, as they say, kick the tires. That's another due diligence perfectly appropriate and should be encouraged. You bring up a great point, Ronnie. I'm actually going out to uh, one of our projects here next week to conduct a due diligence tour and have one of our investors meet the developer, walk the project, see that you know, for this particular project, actually, um, it's called Talus. All the jobs have already been created. It started construction about a year and a half ago. Right? So from an investor standpoint, if you remember what I said, the 526 and the 829, where you have to prove that the jobs are created on the 829, that's already taken care of. So the jobs are already created. You're able to go see the progress that's happened, which is a very exciting thing. I, I think that conservative uh, approach is really the way that you want to do EV5. You, you don't want to get very creative. I'll give you just a quick aside here that you know my family migrated from Spain. My grandfather wanted to come and so did his brother. They flipped the coin. My grandfather won 50% chance and he came to the US. And all of our, and then I'm here now, right? Uh, and my father and, and, and everything else. But if it wasn't for that 50% chance, I probably wouldn't be here. And I think for EB5, you don't have to take that 50% chance. If, if you partner with an experienced regional center that's been doing this for a long time, you know, again, for us, 100% track record investors obtaining a permanent green card but because we're conservative in how we structure our, our, our projects. And I think that's what investors need to look at. And as they're considering an EB-5 firm, a project, you're right, it's a long-term relationship. For us, it is too. And we want to make sure that we're providing the right cultural competencies as well, because every investor is going to be looking at very different things. And then I would also add that you know, as investors are looking at projects, it's important to look at it through two lenses. You know, oftentimes we get really focused on, it has to be a really good immigration investment, or it has to be an investment that's located in X area, but it really has to have a fundamentally strong foundation on the immigration side, just a strong fundamentally, uh, fundamentally sound foundation on the investment side for it to be a good investment for EV-5. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Manny, you, you touched on some great points, and I know that you did just mention Talos there, and all of the jobs that it's already created because as of September 30th, 2023, Talus has actually exceeded the job creation numbers. Our economists, Baker Tilly, have said that the project has already created 1,664 jobs, which far exceeds the uh, the number for all 135 investors. So do you, do you want to touch on, on any other Talus specifics? Let me touch on that too. Since the RAA, let's let's go. Let's understand your investment's gone from five hundred thousand to eight hundred thousand. So now you've got one ten jobs per eight hundred thousand. So you've actually increased your job count by sixty per sixty percent or whatever. You know what I mean when you look at the number. So because of the RIA, it's a lot easier to have a aggregate multiplier job count, and we're seeing that in a lot of projects. I know many of your projects. It's not like a 1.2 to one, it's two or three times, mm -hmm. or three or four times a job. It's not even close. Yeah. So if you're off by a little, you got so much protection. We call that the cushion. And Roe and I are very sensitive. We always want projects that have at least a certain cushion or we won't wreck, we won't undertake it because we don't want to risk. We look at from the investor standpoint, they can't, we, we don't think they should take that risk. Ro, well, to, to talk about the, the job cushion, this one, you know, as I mentioned, each investor has to create 
10 jobs per what the law says. This one, each investor is going to end up creating 40 jobs, right? It's four times what the minimum requirement is. So to your point, exactly. There's no, no job risk. Right. Yeah, so we've already created the the over the minimum requirement, and we're going to continue to create jobs as as the project is being built and as funds are are, are being used on this project. Um, I would just mention that I think it's it's important for as investors are looking at projects just to look at the business case, the investment thesis for why this project is actually happening. You know, in the case of the Talus project, well, it's happening because there hasn't been a ultra luxury resort. It's a montage in a Pendry Hotel with an Arnold Palmer golf course located in the Coachella Valley, very close to Palm Springs, Los Angeles, Orange County. Um, a project like this hasn't been built in the area in the last 40 years. And mm -hmm. now, you know, the Coachella Valley, I want to say it's population of 360,000, 460,000, but you have over 14 million visitors per year that go there. And they're staying at Airbnbs or some of these older properties that are still really nice, but, you know, they're still pretty old, um, over mm -hmm. 40 years when it comes to this type of asset class, there's an actual need for this. The Palm Springs Airport's going through a uh, billion dollar plus infrastructure program just to be able to handle all the people that are going there. Because you mentioned the pandemic earlier, Ronnie, but what we learned is nobody likes to be indoors. And now people are wanting to connect with nature more. And that and that's the perfect place to do that. But that's what I mean, that there's a need for the investment. And so you're, you're basically seeing that the investment case for this, there's actually one that's there. It's not just an immigration product. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, gentlemen, I want to thank you for joining me today. I think we touched on a lot of great points. And to all of our listeners and viewers, I would heartily encourage you to reach out to Manny and Ronnie and Rohit with any questions that you may have. Their information will be linked in the description below. And I want to thank you for listening. And I want to thank you, Manuel and Ronnie and Rohit for joining me today. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much, guys. Well. Thank you so much. Yes. Take care. Bye.